Okay, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I think I'll stand here because I hope the mic works. Okay, good. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Thanks for the invitation. It's a tremendous pleasure to be here. And um, I may need to say at the beginning that I talk through the work from an architectural point of view, but uh, everything that I show, I think, is uh, the result of very interdisciplinary research um, that we have conducted at the University of Stuttgart um, that always involves a very close interface between uh, architects and structural engineers. I think um, what we are primarily interested in is to see how digital technologies change the way we do the, we do what actually really is the key of our profession, and that's building something. No? How actually the digital begins to affect how we think about the physical um, or the material world. And I think this is an important moment in time because I think very often um, we are forced to think that digital technologies ultimately lead to the digitalization of processes that we already know and they just make them more efficient or automate them. But of course, the great opportunity when working with digital technologies is that they offer something new something that was not possible before and I will try to look at that through the presentation in a second. So in my view, the computer is more than a tool. It's really a fundamental change that expands the intuition of the designer fairly dramatically. I very much like the comparison of Sanford Quinter who relates it to other paradigm changing technologies such as the microscope or the telescope which was the origin for the modern human um, because that opened a few on things that usually or that before were outside the scope of what a human can actually grasp and understand. Um, I think it's also important to say that we work within, uh, let's say, a certain culture of uh, integrating architecture and engineering um, and also in exploring, um, let's say, new technologies as a means of design innovation on both an architectural and an engineering point. And of course, one of the great presidents for this is uh, the work that Frey Otto conducted at his institute at the University of Stuttgart. Um, so we're tr trying to sort of extend um, that rich uh, heritage that we are privileged um, to work in the same institution. I think there's also one aspect that um, is similar to the work that Frey Otto did, and that is that if we look at a higher level of integration of form, material, and structure, so I think that's the key for using digital technologies to achieve that higher level of integration, um, then biology is a fantastic role model. Because um, in design, we tend to think that we can separate geometry from material and structure, but of course, when you think about biological entities, you would never think of, you cannot separate form, material, and structure. And I will come to back, come back to that. I think another interesting aspect is that biology makes you question established, let's say, thinking in our discipline. And one nice, um, let's say, aspect of that is mentioned in this quote, in biology, material is expensive, but shape is cheap. And that means material is expensive for the organism to produce. So biology usually invests in complex shape that has high performance rather than adding more material because it's simple to construct. Very different to the way that we still construct most of our buildings. Um, and I think this will be uh, an interesting sort of theme because this is, for example, one of the paradigms that digital technologies really begin to fundamentally challenge. Um, and the way we try to approach that is with a uh, sort of methodology that we like to call co-design. So it's really the idea that you, before you actually design a project, you need to design the feedback between your design and engineering methods your fabrication and construction processes and, that, and your material and building systems. And if you look at those in direct interrelation and it feedback with each other, then you can tap the full potential of digital technologies for a higher level of integration. And this is something that we aim to <coughs> investigate. And this is something that I will show you along two examples. Uh, one is 
looking at actually timber structures, um, so segmented timber shells actually, sort of looking at how this overarching methodology of co-design can work with one of the oldest building materials that we have, and then also looking at it on the diametrically other end of the spectrum of construction materials with uh, glass and carbon fiber structures, load-bearing carbon fiber structures um, that uh, can also be tackled with the same methodology. So that sounds all a bit abstract, so I will directly dive into the projects, but I may need also to take the opportunity to thank the German Research Foundation, DFG, um, that makes actually this work possible. Uh, in the past, we had two collaborative research centers, and we now have this aforementioned cluster of excellence, so this is a very good um, setting um, to actually really uh, have interdisciplinary research that does not only um, integrate architects and structural engineers, but also um, people from computer science, people from robotics, mechanical engineers, but also researchers from social science and researchers um, that have uh, a historical, offer historical reflections. So um, let's look at the first uh, project, um, which is a small exhibition hall um, that we realized in 2014, which was the result of a research project um, that the Institute um, of Jan Knippers, myself, and actually an uh, engineering geodesy colleague uh, conducted, um, which looked at how we can actually use the two resources that are local to Stuttgart. And uh, one is advanced production technology, um, basically robotics uh, for production. And the other is uh, wood, because in the south of Germany, there's no other naturally occurring resource. Um, so we developed a timber building system, which is basically a structural, a structural blade system that is possible because we have new robotic technologies that allow to actually um, produce highly precise parts on a very individual basis with a very mobile, let's say, technology. Um, so um, this is actually possible because the robot is self-correcting. So it is not like your regular CNC machine that follows a pre-established path, but the, your robot actually monitors deviations from the sort of ideal path and compensates for that in real time. So you get very, very high precision, even using a very small machine. Um, so this building system, of course, uh, has certain challenges. So the goal was that we say we go back um, using actually the edge of the panel as the interface between the building elements. So the aim was to avoid additional metal fasteners, adhesives, really have the panels just joined through force and form fitting um, finger joints um, and build the load bearing structure as that. Um, of course, that has certain challenges. If you look at uh, the performance of these finger joints, they're very good in transferring uh, the shear forces at the edge of the plate. Of course, they are really tricky when it comes to um, resisting bending forces or tension. They're totally useless. So it's a challenge. And this is the moment where it's really interesting to look for a model um, that sits outside our discipline that has addressed exactly the challenge. Because at that moment, you may be tempted to say, this is not a very good idea. Then we look at nature and we find systems that work exactly in this way. There's a cent dollar, um, which is a kind of sea urgent, which is actually made, the, the blade skeleton is made from these plates, polygonal plates. Um, if you find them on the beach, you can actually uh, dismantle it, put it back together. And that works because if you zoom in and you look at the edge of the plate to plate connection, it's actually the biological equivalent of our finger joints. So that means um, these animals live on the shore. They're exposed to waves, really strong impact uh, forces. Um, that means that the sand dollar has found a way to sort of evolve a morphology that transfers all the forces on the sh in the shell um, to be basically transferred through um, shear forces at the plate edges. And that is um, the principle that we try to transfer. That's an uh, sort of was a four year research project with uh, specialists in biomechanics from the University of Tübingen. 
There are a lot of other principles, but that is the overarching one. Um, and we try to integrate that into um, a design tool that makes sure that any plate structure we will design coheres with these biomimetic rules. Um, but of course also needs to anticipate other constraints that we will have. Um, of course, one is the geometric constraints. If you want to build something from planar wood panels, it's actually not a trivial task. If we have synclastic curvature, anticlastic curvature, and almost um, zero Gaussian curvature on that side. So that in and of itself means you have to transition between very different polygon types. We need to anticipate what is actually really producible. I think we often are misled and think that either digital technologies can produce everything, so we under constrain our models, or we assume that it cannot do anything and then we sort of over constrain our models. So this is really tuning the design process with what the machine and this specific machine setup can actually really do by running a simulation in parallel. Um, and then of course we also have to make sure that um, we justify the requirements or we sort of to, uh, comply with the requirements of the building code um, and in the end we want to directly com uh, communicate with the machine. So this is the process we have developed. It's an agent-based design system where all the blades actually navigate in space to try to comply with all these requirements. So what is really interesting about this from an architectural point of view is that this is not design automation. This is actually an interactive model so you can go in, you can grab blade 54, you can move it by hand, and then the, all the other aspects, are, all the other plates recompute. So I think it's a very nice way of showing how digital technologies allow a new kind of human-machine interaction where the computer takes care of the incredibly complex, let's say, reciprocal relations between the aforementioned parameters, and you can still design with that in interaction with the computer taking care of this. We have further developed that and we now are able to actually read out the fabrication parameters in real time. So at any moment in time, you know what the economic repercussions of your design are. And um, we also have that hooked that up to real time life cycle analysis. So you also know about the ecological um, repercussions of your design. Two things that we usually analyze after the design is done or iteratively. Here it happens in real time in direct feedback. So then the plates, um, back to the plate system. Um, what is interesting also is that our technology basically hooks up into a regular um, woodworking process. So this is a speed panel cutter that almost all big timber manufacturers have. That has much higher tolerances. Um, it basically preformats the plates in two or three minutes per plate, um, puts a sticker on it. Um, that sticker is machine readable. The robot gets the information and that's actually the highly precise milling of the edges, so it's only used where it's really necessary. It also does the pilot hole drilling um, and it achieves tolerances of around 0.4 millimeter in that regard. And of course, you need these really close, these really tight tolerances in order to make that system work as a form and force fitting structure. <laughs> because in the end, it is assembled like a three-dimensional puzzle um, in space and I want to make you aware that this is, this is the load bearing structure, 50 millimeter beach plywood. Um, there's no ad additional uh, material. Um, here you get a sense of how thin that is. The space is around 10, 10 meters span and uh, 20 meters long. Um, this needed to be an exhibition space, so it also has insulation, water barrier, and on the outside it has a timber cladding. Um, which is only a cladding, but on the inside, you actually see the actual load bearing structure, which at the same time is the architectural surface and expresses somehow the, the in a very authentic manner, um, I think the structure system as the key architectural feature. Um, so I think it's a nice way of showing how, um, let's say an architecture can be um, very, I would say efficient and effective while also being expressive and quite evocative at the same time. It is an efficient structure if you look at it from a material resource point of view. 
um, the, entire, the entire load bearing structure to enclose 605 cubic meters of space was built with using just 12 cubic meters of wood. And we were able to use the entirety of this wood um, because all the offcuts from the irregular polygons were already anticipated from the beginning to be reprocessed as the hardwood flooring. So no material left over. Um, if we look at that in proportion, um, 50 millimeter beach plywood shell spanning 10 meters is around um, half the thickness of an eggshell, although we are scaling up. Um, and another aspect that I find very important is that this is a truly regional architecture. All the building material we used for the timber shell was, so, was actually grown, processed, and actually um, uh, sort of in a 200 kilometer radius. Actually, all the know-how that was added comes from 100 meter radius. And that's, of course, not only important from an environmental point of view, but it's also important from a social point of view because all the value is actually added and where you build the building, not somewhere else. Um, we took this quite a bit further. So this uh, initial building was actually um, completed in 2014. Um, now, uh, just recently, we completed another timber shell that takes the same principle further. Um, this is an exhibition space that is embedded in the landscape of uh, the Bundesgartenschau, which is traditionally a event for, I would say, architectural innovation in Germany. Um, it's an event space um, that caters for concerts, so it also needed to have a very good acoustic, um, <coughs> and it has a span of around 30 meters. So our challenge here was to say, five years later, how can we build a building, a shell that spans three times as much, covers six times as much space, using the same amount of material as in 2015, um, in that showcasing what the kind of possible improvements are that can come through such a co-design approach. Um, I can already say that we achieved that. So this is the Landesgarten Show 2014, 11 meter span, 36.8 kilograms per square meter. Um, the Bundesgarten Show has 30 meter span and weighs 36 kilograms per square meter. So it's a little bit less material and as I said, three times the span, six times the covered area. This was possible because we refined our agent system quite a bit so that it can now have direct um, structural feedback, um, which of course relies on the interaction with the colleague Jan Knippers. Um, but one of the main aspects is that we no longer work with solid blades, but we actually have sort of changed to a system where the blade segment is a hollow cassette system. So it is, um, this is one plate now, which has a bottom plate that has this hole in it. <laughs> then there's a rim beam, and then there's a top plate. And this is glued together with a structural glue joint. And in that way, we achieve sort of the reduction of material. It's also a very nice example where most people would say, this is not really a great idea, because by changing from one building element to up to eight or nine, you basically increase the production complexity tremendously. Yeah? So it, it may make sense from a resource saving point of view, but it does not really make sense from a production cost point of view. That's why we developed a digital uh, a robotic fabrication setup that actually compensates that, offsets that extra cost by producing these um, hollow elements completely automatically. So this is what you see here. This is our platform. So it's a nice example, I think, of co-design because we designed with the building system, with the structural system, we designed the production system at the same time. And it only works if you do that in feedback with, with each other. It's not relying on an existing technology, but it's sort of trying to push these two things um, uh, sort of uh, in a synchronous fashion. So this is our... Um, second generation of a timber manufacturing platform. It sits on a regular container platform, so you can take it to any timber manufacturer. Um, it's transportable. You can even could use it on site. Um, and then um, this very compact manufacturing unit is able to produce um, these cells. 
So you see, it puts the bottom plate, it applies the glue automatically, then it uh, places the rim beams. The rim beams are located temporarily with wood nails. Um, that's only there to make sure that the rim beams stay in place. It applies the top glue, puts the top plate on it, puts it on the stack, it goes into the press, um, comes back into the same cell, is machined by the same robots, and then actually it has, a, it's a highly precise building element. Here we achieve tolerances of less than two tenths of a millimeter. And that's something we actually verified by laser scanning every single one of those elements, and we keep on scanning them even in the kind of build structure. Having um, such tight tolerances mean that you can build these shells in a fairly unconventional manner. You don't need any foam work, no scaffolds. It's a 30 meter shell and you can build it from one side um, or from three sides and they meet at the top. You put the cornerstone in and it's done. Took a bit of convincing for the proof engineer who was worried what happens if there's a strong storm here. So actually the construction and stage engineering was as demanding as the final uh, um, piece. But I think it nicely shows how, let's say, a lot of problems associated with cell shell structures are somehow addressed um, by these kind of segmented approaches. <coughs> so this is the final shell. Um, everything that you see is load-bearing structure. Um, the hollow cassettes are um, here used for illumination, but they also work extremely well in terms of acoustics. So. Um, in this case, we had a client, and the client was actually quite worried because he heard that lightweight structures and acoustics don't go together, which probably is true, but here it's geometrically, um, basically the, the, the sound is caught in the, shell, in the shell in the same way that in traditional Persian architecture, in the music chambers in Isfahan, you have those holes, and then it's, sort of the, it's basically exactly the same principle. That's also something we verified before. But I think it's nice that you can actually address all these criteria um, with the structure actually itself. Um, this is the building. Um, and um, in the meantime, we have developed that further. This was a competition entry for the State of Baden-Württemberg Pavilion at the Expo, where we unfortunately only got the second place. Um, but um, we have also done now um, a feasibility study for a larger factory building. We have showed that the system works even for um, larger, I mean, this is a 27 by 130 meter um, span, um, and it can compete in terms of price with relatively regular industrial sort of architecture. And um, most importantly, the system offers possibilities to build in places where it is usually very difficult to build. This is a project we have currently on go. Um, this is a parking lot in a city center in Germany. The basic construction is from the 1960s, concrete. Um, then it was already extended with a steel structure um, in the early 2000s. And then we can now extend it with an additional two floors by using this very, very lightweight timber structure, um, which would be very difficult to achieve with anything else because it basically um, uh, the foundations are pretty limited in a 1960s German parking garage. <clears throat> With that, um, I would like to move on to the second generation of uh, materials that we work with. And I think it's interesting to note that when we look at um, our timber structures, um, we talk about the biological fiber composite. In the end, timber is cellulose fibers with uh, a matrix of uh, lignin and hemicellulose. And when we sort of investigated that further, we realized that almost all load-bearing structures in nature are actually fiber composites. And what's also interesting is that nature does not use um, very uh, sort of a great variety of materials. It's always cellulose in plants, chitin, um, typically in insects and crustaceans, and collagen in most other animals. And those materials are not great materials to start off with, but the way they turn into these fantastically high-performance structures in nature is the way that nature arranges the material in space. So it's the orientation, the density, and the spatial arrangement, which is the key. 
Um, what is also interesting is that these natural fibers fundamentally work fairly similar to the synthetic fibers that we currently have, glass fiber, carbon fiber. Um, so we can actually uh, look into nature for, let's say, fundamental design principles to work with these fibers uh, in building construction. And of course, these, these materials challenge our conception of construction in many respects. No? Here you have a material, this is this um, 50K roving, where one kilometer of material weighs one kilogram. So it sort of is slightly different to most of the construction materials we have, which are heavy materials, bulk materials. Um, this is something that starts off as uh, something as, as sort of as flexible um, as a, a silk and turns into basically some a material that is um, re relative to its weight, uh, stronger and stiffer than steel. I will show that um, through a project that we completed in 2016, which was um, a load-bearing fiber composite structure for a pavilion that we finished, that we did for the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, this is the Victoria and Albert Museum, which is very nice because it was, uh, this is actually the arts and science store, um, which I think is quite fitting for the for the work, but I think um, the Victorian Art Museum was built as the venue for the first World Expo um, in London, um, basically to celebrate the empire, but um, then it was extended so that there is now a courtyard which is visited by around four, four million people a year. So the relatively simple task of, um, for us was to build a roof that is more or less a weather shelter um, for this courtyard to make it more usable um, during sunshine as a shading device and more commonly in the UK um, during rain so that you have a bit of weather protection. What is interesting is that the, that, that courtyard is only accessible through the exhibition of the Victorian Albert Museum. So you cannot transport material in, in any other way than actually literally walking through the exhibition. And um, that nobody really knows what is under the courtyard, so you are only allowed to have very, very, very slender um, foundations for that space. So um, what we came up with is this uh, carbon fiber structure, which meant that we won the competition for this um, piece, which was part of the engineering season, which was quite nice for us because given that uh, London has a lot of very capable structural engineers, we were pleased and we were able to basically base our work on a lot of research that we had done previously on one of the most versatile composite structures that we find in nature, which are those uh, so-called elytrons, um, which are the forewings of beetles. So these are these hardened shells that protect the flying wings um, when they're not used. So in beetles that only crawl on the ground, terrestrial or ground beetles, this is a microscopic section. This is a solid piece of material. But for flying beetles, this is actually um, a very delicate double-layered <coughs> shell system. So we analyzed that um, for various different species um, using um, a particle accelerator um, to do, to basically scan these structures together with our colleagues from biology so I think it's another nice example. So here you have a comprehensive three-dimensional model. This is a 3D scan of this elytron that has a resolution of three micron. Um, and that allows you to engage with the colleagues from biology in doing a comparative analysis of the various different elytron species or the kind of elytra of different species. And then you may then what is really interesting is that you find that nature addresses all kinds of different, let's say, design challenges um, with one and the same material. So here you have a shell. In one of the beetles, you have a shell that rests on two support points. Here you have a shell that rests on something that we would probably call a wall with a huge cantilever on the other side. And nature addresses all that with one and the same material system, something we would probably never do in building construction. And what is also interesting is when you zoom in, you see that on the level of the double-layered shell, nature also does something quite counterintuitive. 
It does not have an upper surface and a lower surface with some connecting elements in between, but all the fibers between the upper layer and the lower layer of that shell are continuous. Um, and that's actually what makes it such a high performance structure. So what we have done is we abstracted this principle into a building element where the carbon fibers are actually, and the glass fibers are continuous between the upper and lower surface and thus achieve a high level of performance. At the same time, we aim to address one of the fundamental problems with using glass and carbon fiber composites in construction, and that is that we usually require to have a mold. So our conceptualization of these materials is that they are somewhat amorphic. Huh? So that they, 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 don't, they don't have a shape themselves, they always need a shaping device. This is the mold for a, a turbine, wind turbine blade at Siemens. And you can imagine that if you build such a mold, you have to build a lot of those turbine blades um, to make this a profitable um, undertaking. So our aim was to reduce the mold to a very simple scaffold and make the fibers find the shape themselves through the interaction in the manufacturing process. So this is the scaffold, and then the robot actually lays the fibers on that scaffold, and in the process of winding around that scaffold, the shape of the element actually emerges. That's what you can see here. <coughs> um, so those are the very different elements. You can see it's a very different way of working with these materials. It's not a surface structure. It's actually really a spatial structure that uh, emerges. Um, that this is the glass fiber, which is laid wet onto the scaffold, so it runs through a resin bath, and then it's spun around the scaffold by the robot. And here you can see how the white glass fiber is laid. The, the glass fiber turns into almost like an integrated mold, so the glass fiber generates the shape, and then the carbon fiber is laid onto that shape exactly where you need it. So. In the calculations, actually, only the carbon fiber is considered um, as the load-bearing structure. And the interesting thing about this is that you can um, build many, many different element structures using exactly the same process, but tailoring each single one to the specific forces that it needs, so to, to the specific forces in my experience. So here, um, you may see that this edge may cantilever, so it has small glass fibers here and so on. And with that, this is the way it's actually done. It's initially a shell model, and then on the shell model, the initial placement of fibers is done. The fiber layout is generated, and then the evaluation happens on the fiber level. Um, and with that approach, we achieve extremely lightweight components. Um, one of those elements has around five square meters and weighs between 35 and 85 kilograms. So on average, it's a weight of 9.6 kilograms per square meter load-bearing structure. <clears throat> it also is interesting from the point of view that it really challenges our understanding of what the building site is, because this is the production unit for the whole roof. You only need six square meters, a robot, this spinning wheel, a bucket of resin, and a spool of glass fibers, and with that, you can build the entire structure. Um, so it means that we can actually do local production. That's what we tried to do there. Or that's what we did here. So we kept on building the pavilion when it was already there. I think that's also interesting because it somehow questions our understanding that we usually have a design phase. The design phase needs to come to an end. Then we have the construction phase. The construction phase needs to be completed. Then we have a use phase. And then at the end of the life cycle, we actually have the deconstruction phase. I think what you have here is that all these phases begin to overlap and happen at the same time. Um, and the way that this process is steered is actually by the humans inhabiting the pavilion. So there was not a final design state, which also made the proof engineer pretty worried, honestly. This, this had to actually go through extensive proof engineering because the VNA confronted us with a 500-page contract <laughs> um, because there's a lot of invaluable British cultural heritage around it. So they wanted to make three times sure that it will work in the end. Um, 
But coming back to this, so what we do is we monitor how people navigate through that space and we do this by uh, in a totally anonymous fashion. Um, so we can actually track the presence of people, their itineraries. We at the same time track the environmental conditions through what is the universal thermal climate index and from that we extrapolate how the structure should grow, expand or contract. And this, was ha this is what happened during the um, lifetime of the pavilion in this space. Um, and we actually managed to convince um, the proof engineer by saying we basically monitor the forces in the roof um, through the composite structure with fiber optics that we can lay in the process. Um, and through that, we have an additional sort of verification that no excessive uh, uh, forces will ever occur in the structure. Um, so this is the, this is the structure. Um, there's not a single piece of steel in this roof. Um, it's all, all the load bearing structure is just glass and carbon fiber composites. And I think what is really nice about it is that it's not just, let's say, a technological innovation, but it's also an architectural innovation at the same time. So I think it's a nice um, example of, let's say, co-designing um, the architectural expression, the, the, the way this, it works as a structure and the fabrication process because you cannot disintegrate these three elements um, in these systems. Um, maybe I have to move on a little bit. Um, so we extended this um, in the next project um, to a much larger structure, which is this dome um, that we built for the Bundesgartenschau. Um, this is now a dome that spans around uh, 25 meters and consists out of 60 glass and carbon fiber elements, which again, the, ha the, the glass and carbon fiber is the load bearing structure. So here you see that. Um, it's maybe also important to say that while this being an experimental building, it need to fulfill all the requirements of a German building application. So we had to go through a full proof engineering certification process. So it's not something that we do sort of in the backyard, um, <clears throat> which was one of the main challenges here. So the evolution is from this, let's say, plate-like system to a rod-like structure to build this dome which means that we can, uh, uh, this has several significant um, advantages. So we have a lot less connection points. Um, we have a faster production process, but the principle remains to be the same. You basically have a very simple scaffold for all the components the same. You can change that angle here, but nothing else changes. Um, then you lay the glass fibers. They find the form of the element themselves. And on that shape, you lay the carbon fibers, which are the um, load bearing structure. Um, these are the photos, so this is how it works in the real. Um, this is the improved setup that we have developed now. Um, we did all the experimental and the research for the structure, but it was ultimately built by a spin-off company from our institute that does now offer these services, services um, commercially. What is again interesting is that this requires a highly integrative design approach you need to basically, with the design of the layout of the fibers, you address the architectural concerns, you address the structural concerns, you basically have to integrate the fabrication. It is all sort of taken into account, uh, which requires a highly integrative design process. And of course, it also requires fairly um, complex models for verification. In the end, um, the building authorities require destructive testing for the elements as the ultimate form of verification. Um, so we built three of those elements um, for destructive testing and then each single element needed to go through non-destructive testing. Um, and uh, I think it's interesting to see that this element, of course the worst case is um, compression. Um, and uh, this is the setup we developed for the um, authorities and these very delicate elements can take up to 250 kilonewtons in compression, which I would say is quite significant for an element that weighs around 75 to 80 kilograms. So this is the actual full production at the company um, and then the erection on site. Um, here we have slightly larger tolerances, which we compensate for with, I think, uh, 
connection system that still would benefit from some further um, refinements. And in the end, let's say that uh, there's a transparent membrane that is just mechanically pre-stressed um, over the pavilion um, that creates this very nice, um, very transparent skin, um, which allows you to appreciate this kind of novel structural system from the outside as well as the inside. I think what I really like about this is that somehow, although most people don't have seen something like this before, I mean, there are around 2 million visitors to this, uh, or have been, this is almost close now, um, people still understand how it works because you somehow intuitively understand that probably the black parts are doing the work. Um, they understand how there's a continuous sort of transfer from how the, how the, basically the, the, the forces are handed over from one fiber to the next one through the connections. So I think it's very novel, but it's also very authentic and self-explaining in many ways. Um, <clears throat> so, um, and of course, it means you can build with a material that emits light, which is something that is, of course, also very fascinating um, as an architectural feature. And it means that there's a huge change of the perception between being illuminated during daytime through the sun and being illuminated at nighttime from within. So we're now working, or we just uh, have the setup ready for building another element um, that is 12 meters long, which we also test um, and we're also looking at uh, further refinements to do quality assurance in the process so that we have recorded data about the fiber saturation and the pre-stress of the fibers at any moment in time because we really want to get down from a safety factor of four which was required for this building. So you could actually do it sort of with half the material but um, for that you need to have other protocols in place to assure that it's definitely safe and sound. Um, I will wrap up. Um, I just have one small outlook that is also interesting, um, uh, and I will have to uh, quickly go through that. I think what is interesting is that in biology, we also very often find that the fibers are not only the load-bearing structure, but they can also trigger movement. So it's a different kind of movement that we know. It doesn't require a machine. It doesn't require muscles. It actually just works through the material. A very nice example are uh, plant cones. They change their shape just um, based on the re uh, humidity, the moisture content in the material. So they actually transfer a dimensional change into a shape change. And this is a process that we have worked with for quite a while, initially for building, um, actually, let's say building skins that do require zero energy to operate, as you can see here. So this aperture works opens and closes with just with changes in relative humidity in the ambient atmosphere. Um, then we always got the question, this is not useful, these are two millimeter veneers, and with that, this is the, it's about the principle, and actually it works as a structure, um, it works as a building skin also extremely well, but we have now um, shown that it also works for structural pieces of wood, the same principle, um, so you can actually produce bilayers where the bottom is, uh, the, the lower part is about a 30 millimeter lamella, the top is 10 millimeters, and it still shapes by itself just in the drying process. Um, this is something that we just published in Science Advances, so I will not go into detail with that, but we can predict this um, movement, the shape change, um, to a precision of around 4% for beach, 10% for um, a spruce, and that meant that we could also showcase that in a demonstrator building that is actually built with this self-shaping material. Um, so it's a, it's a tower, 14 meter tall tower that utilizes this process. Um, here you can see the bilayers in a kiln at the timber manufacturer. So it's using the regular industrial drying process. It does not require any additional drying. Um, it just requires these uh, special scaffolds or special, let's say, uh, uh, stacks. Here are the self-shaping elements. They go in the kiln straight. They come out with a curvature that can be determined with 4% precision. Um, that means that you can actually program an initially straight piece of wood to take this kind of complex shape. 
um, which was then machined and is basically the load bearing structure of um, the tower. So you have two of those lamella layers, you laminate them together, they are locked, you have a complex shaped CLT structure um, that was again assembled with zero tolerances um, in less than five hours and um, there's a cladding on the outside of course but on the inside you have the sort of load bearing timber structure um, that was all sort of done from a straight piece of wood. Um, with that I have to conclude because I think I extended my sort of reached the time limit already quite substantially. Thank you. You have a taxi leaving in five minutes, but maybe there is a comment or question. So I Oh yeah, sorry, that's the most important part. Um, the of course the metal scaffold is taken out. Uh, of all of these um, uh, components. So we reuse the same metal scaffold every time. So it actually collapses like an umbrella frame uh, and you can just pull it out in the center. So these are always designed as, this was complicated, actually meant that it almost took as much time to build, so robotically build the system as it took to basically take the frame out and set it up again. That's why we then changed these much simpler systems which don't require any um, sort of dismantling, you just sort of, they just sh shift it and then you can uh, produce the next one. Yeah. All right, you have to leave. If you okay. Have been waiting for you. Thank Sorry. you very much. <laughs>